Hello everyone and welcome to Bank Grade Security. My name is Kieran Jacobson. My pronouns are he and him. Before I start, I want to acknowledge the traditional owners of the country throughout Australia and recognise their continuing connection to land, waters and culture. I pay res my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. So today we're going to be following Eve. They're not happy with their current bank and they've decided it's time to make a change. They don't care about things like interest rates. Um, they're more worried about the security posture of the bank itself. They want to use a bank that demonstrates that they follow modern security practices. Now, they're not going to just read the bank's websites and trust what they've got to say or read their social media and trust that. They actually want to evaluate the controls that each bank has enacted on their web, a their web ass assets or their websites. Eve is of the belief, and so am I, that how an organization controls and secures their public websites tells you a lot about their internal security controls and their internal security attitudes. So this is the list of banks that Eve has decided to assess today. It includes a lot of names that you'll probably be very familiar with. Um, the big four banks, Westpac, Com Commonwealth, NAB and ANZ are there, as well as the subsidiary banks that they own. Um, there's also a few uh, household names and some of the regional banks as well. For each of these, their corporate website and their personal or home internet banking site is part of the assessment. Australia's four neobanks have also been included. So a neobank, they're 100% digital. They use mobile web apps to provide their customers with access. They don't have traditional phone banking, they don't have a traditional web app experience, it's all mobile app driven. And they're very, t yeah, very uh, technology focused, these banks, a lot more than the classic uh, banks that you normally interact with. And Eve is interested to see how these new banks are going to fare compared to the banks that have been around for, you know, 100 plus years. So Up, uh, Zinja, uh, 86400, um, their corporate website and their mobile API, API endpoints have been included in the assessment. Uh, for Vault, as they still actually haven't gone into production, so to speak, only their corporate website has been included. Eve is going to use uh, a set of assessment criteria to test each of these sites. And there's three different pieces of criteria. The first is looking at HTTP response headers and which ones are being sent. Um, these are headers that provide various uh, protection levels to clients accessing websites. The second is the configuration uh, and deployment of SSL and TLS. Uh, are any legacy protocols in use? What about insecure ciphers? And finally, does the organization support the reporting of security vulnerabilities through the use of a security.txt file? Eve wants to perform these assessments using tools that anyone and any person of the public can use. Um, after all, she wants these, or they want these assessments to be accessible by anybody. They want anybody to be able to repeat these results. Um, as such, all of the tools that are going to be discussed today, you can use via a web browser. If you're so interested, you could pick your favorite bank and do these assessments on your mobile as I go along. So let's look at the first criteria, HTTP headers. There are several HTTP headers that can be used to increase the security of your web application. And once you've set these, you can restrict modern web browsers from running into a lot of easily preventable security vulnerabilities. The implementation of these HTTP headers is actually really easy. I don't like using the term easy, but in this case, they are really simple to get right. Um, sometimes it's just a few lines of uh, code in your application configs, sometimes it's a couple of lines in your web server configuration, it's actually pretty simple stuff. Considering how easy it is, a lot of these headers have actually been introduced for about five or six years ago, but their use within the industry and within uh, the, over the internet as a whole is still remarkably low, really quite low. 
So there's a website called Security Headers, and that allows you to perform a scan of a website and check if that site is sending the correct response headers. The site was developed by Scott Helm. Um, he doesn't get anything for running this service. It's just something that he creates and maintains to give back to uh, helping secure the internet. Security headers looks at seven different security related headers deter and determines if these are following best practice. It then combines all of these ratings from all of these together to form a rating from A plus right through to F for failure. Eve has performed an assessment of each of the bank's websites, taking note of the grades that they've received and also what headers were part of the response back. So let's take a look at the results. Um, Aussie banks performed better than the sites listed in Tranco's top 100 websites. Um, since DDD Melbourne this year, when I first presented on this topic, there's been some significant improvements. The results have gotten better over the last four months. But there's still a lot of room for improvement, a really big uh, room for improvement. Only a single bank scored an A-plus rating. One bank, and that was UpBank. Only just under 10% received a rating of A. Um, the majority of the banking sites are receiving either a C or a D, with 27% and 48% respectively. And this is really quite disappointing. The scary part is the final group of, so of sites, those receiving a failing grade. 9% of the sites assessed received that failing grade. To receive a failing grade, you're not sending any security-related headers at all. Of the seven or eight that are uh, monitored, you've sent none of them through. Um, when we compare this to the top one million websites, it doesn't seem like a bit of a problem that only 9% of these sites got a failing grade. Doesn't seem like much of a problem. But these are banking websites. These are organizations that want us to trust them, and yet they're getting a failing grade. So we need to give out some awards. As I said earlier, the clear winner is UpBank. After DDD Melbourne, um, they went to work and really pushed to up their game. They only received this, this sort of rating a few weeks ago. Um, they are Australia's first banking site to receive that A-plus rating, and it's really well done. Uh, they, they did really, a really good job. I was impressed with how they actually received the feedback uh, from my session, and I'll talk a bit more about that a bit later. But they took the feedback, they went, and they, you can really tell how well they've implemented a lot of these security features, and you'll hear their name coming up again and again. Suncorp is the clear runner-up. Um, they received a uh, A-plus rating for their corporate website, um, sorry, an A rating for their corporate website and their internet banking website. Um, Bankwest was also up here. Um, they scored a A rating for their internet, rate, internet banking, but they only scored a, a D for their corporate website. So obviously they've focused a lot more of their security posture on their internet banking website. Totally makes sense. Um, let's drill into some more specific headers. So HTTP Strict Transport Security, or HSTS, is basically a safety net for TLS. Um, it's one of the most important security improvements that you can do for the TLS security for your website. Um, HSTS provides strong protections against person-in-the-middle attacks by forcing all communications to happen over a secure channel. Once a browser visits a website over HTTPS and receives this header, two superpowers of your web browser will automatically be activated for that website. The first is that all HTTP links on that site are rewritten as HTTPS, all done automatically. The second is that if the user receives a certificate warning later on for that same domain, they're not able to click through those warnings. So if they go to your banking website, they get that heading, then they're on some dodgy Wi-Fi at a conference and they try to go to that website and it's doing a person in the middle attack, the browser will actually block them from being able to step through. That's a really great security feature. HSTS also offers what's called preloading. In this case, 
we actually submit our website to be preloaded into that HSTS list by all the modern browsers, so Chrome, Firefox, Edge, Safari. For sites that are preloaded into the browser, no communication will ever happen over an insecure connection, which means there's no way for a person in the middle attack to really happen on that site, which is a massive improvement for security. So how do we get preloaded? Firstly, you've got to have a valid certificate. Secondly, you've got to redirect all of your traffic to HTTPS. Next, you need to serve all of your subdomains over HTTPS. This includes the mail server and the dodgy marketing server and the ad tracking things and all of them, they all have to be over HTTPS. The final steps is to have the, the preload flag in your HSTS header. And you need to have some specific instructions as well. You need to have a, a minimum length of time, which is a year. Um, and you need a flag that subdomains are included and flag that you're ready to be preloaded. Once you've met all of these requirements, you can visit HS, hstspreload.org and submit your domain for browser preloading. So let's see how the banks went. Initial assessment showed that less than half of the sites had a HSTS header. After some tweaks with the assessment um, criteria, actually that number rose to 80%, which is probably the best rating aside from one of the TLS settings across all of the banks is 80%. And on the surface, it appears to be a really great result. However, there's a lot of problems with how the banks have implemented. There's a lot of things that have not followed best practice. Um, things like very small uh, maximum age conditions on that header, uh, subdomains not being included, um, redirects from the root of the domain to www, which breaks the option for preloading, um, or even just serving that HSTS header over HTTP because that's an invalid configuration. So there's still a lot of room for improvement there with the banks. Overall, I'm disappointed that not a single Australian bank is actually ready for HSTS preloading. All of them in some way, just their configurations are slightly broken right now and it would only require a little bit more effort to get there, but they're all broken in some way. My belief is that if you're a financial institution, a government site, social network, a telecommunications company, or a particularly large or obvious target in the internet landscape, you should be preloading. That's my opinion, and I think that that should be a standard across most organizations. So to me, it feels like the banks are still lagging a little bit when it comes to protecting their customers from person in the middle attacks. Content security policy, or CSP, this is another really important header. It adds a layer of security that helps you detect and mitigate certain types of attacks, specifically cross-site scripting and data injection attacks. Um, these are often used for data theft attacks, um, website defacements, or even the distribution of malware. A CSP header is a whitelist of approved resources that can be loaded by a user's browser. Um, you can control a wide range of content from fonts to videos, um, to images, to scripts, and style sheets. You can define where a browser will load them from. It's not a blacklist, it's a whitelist. It has a built-in reporting mechanism, which allows you to collect reports of when these violations happen. If a browser's trying to go to load a script from somewhere you haven't approved, you, there's a built-in reporting mechanism, so you as a website administrator will be told. Um, there's tools like Report URI, um, they will allow you to collect those in an easy to understand and uh, manageable fashion. Um, to make it easier, you can actually start by using a report only mode. So you don't have to go and put this whitelist in and just hope that the site works. You can start with the, with the report only whitelist, check that you've got no reports, and then move into that enforcement model if you want. Three banks have uh, CSP headers, only three banks, and that's UP, Suncorp, and Bankwest. So what happens if I tried to put in some sneaky cross-site scripting into a site like UP's or Bankwest? 
So for this demo, it's not really important in detail what's happening here, but I've opened up a browser's developer tools. I've tried to load some JavaScript via the console, and the browser sees that it's not on the approved list, so it rejects it outright. Um, and as you can see here in this console, it's just saying I've blocked it because of policy. So what happens to a site that doesn't have these protections? So I'm going to play a video here in a second. Um, it does have some flashing and moving text, just in case anyone's sensitive to that. Just let me know, and I'll give you a few seconds to leave the room if you need to. Awesome. Con los I just love Hasselhoff at the end. <laughs> just, it's a f beautiful final touch. Um, big thanks to Breno de Winter uh, who did this with some of the European banks and I got the inspiration from there. Um, this is the sort of stuff that a nice person can do to a site where there isn't a CSP policy. Um, but of course, attackers could do anything that they want, you know, from loading malware to, to um, you know, defacing your website in uh, more impolite ways. So I've got two final observations about the headers that some of the banking sites are using. I was really surprised to see that uh, more than a third of the sites uh, were leaking information about the web servers in use and the web platforms in use and even some of the infrastructure in use. Um, removing these headers is it's security through obscurity. That's never actually a constructive form of security. But it's always one of the first things you'll find in a web server or web application security guide. Uh, and in my experience of seeing any of these guides that organizations have built based off stuff that they've found on the internet or from various sort of security companies, there's always something that says, hey, you know, go and turn these headers off, disable these headers. So to find sites where this hasn't happened makes me really wonder what practices are going on in these organizations around hardening their web applications and web servers. Um, it's just a weird thing that I was expecting to not see, and to see it in a third of websites really did surprise me. The last issue was that one of the banks actually had a uh, invalid host key pinning or HPKP header. Um, this is a header that basically allows you to say which SSL certificates are valid for a site. Um, you can basically permanently block any browser from accessing your website with an invalid configuration. So it was a bit surprising to see that there was a bank that was issuing an invalid header. Thankfully, it's so invalid it will never kick in, but it was still a surprise to see that happening. So what can you do when you go back to the office on Monday? Review the response headers for your web applications and sites. You can use securityheaders.com or your own browser's web, um, dev tools. It doesn't really matter but you should identify and deploy headers that will help secure your applications. Reporting tools are a must, uh, not just during the implementation, but during the long-term running of your site. Um, they provide a wealth of security and health monitoring um, information through from the browser through to your, you know, your, your server, your monitoring dashboards, and it's really, really powerful stuff. So let's now look at SSL and TLS configuration. It's 2019, and the encryption of HTTP traffic is really important. And it's not just to protect our business transactions, or our logins, or our confidential information, but to protect all web traffic. From government spooks, to local city councils, and even our telecommunication companies, um, they're all trying to snoop and modify the content that we see on the internet. And HTTPS is the strongest level of protection 
against these negative antisocial behaviors. TLS is a deceptively simple technology. As an industry, especially in InfoSec, we've pushed for websites and organizations to have an encryption by default um, world, so to speak. It has become significantly easier for people to deploy TLS onto their sites, but there's been a very limited amount of investment in ensuring that the default configurations of a lot of TLS stacks are actually secure. And there's plenty of services that come by default that are terribly insecure. And there's plenty of services that come from big vendors like Cisco and uh, Citrix and F5 that have a lot of insecure options enabled by default. In some respects, the IT industry has come up with a bit of a false sense of security. We now think TLS is on, that's all I have to worry about. It's got a valid certificate, it's all fine. We're not thinking about whether it's actually been deployed in it with a secure configuration. So SSL Labs is a non-commercial effort led by Qualys. Um, the goal of this effort is to provide tools to help organizations and users follow best practice when it comes to TLS configurations. Their SSL server test tool can be used to inspect the configuration of any public website the tool will look at certificates, protocols, cipher suites, HSTS headers, and if there are any known vulnerabilities in that, S that TLS stack. It's gonna get all this information, put it together, and once again, it creates a rating from A plus down to F. Eve has performed this assessment on each of the bank's websites, and the results are then put into everybody's favorite tool, Excel, so we can look at the results. Australian banks actually did really well compared to the global results maintained by SSL Pulse. Uh, SSL Pulse is another project maintained by SSL Labs. They monitor 150,000 websites that are listed in Alexia's um, list of most popular websites. Australian banks scored um, A or A plus. Most of the banks scored really, really well. Um, 10% of banks scored a rating of B, and no bank actually got a rating of, of C. One bank got a rating of F, and we'll talk about that bank in a little bit. So there's five clear winners for this. Combank, UP, ANZ, Zinja, uh, and AMP. They all scored an A plus for both their corporate website and the internet banking or mobile API endpoints. So we have some, some good news in this. Uh, and it's a really great result. But as I said, one bank received a failing grade on their internet banking site. Not their corporate website, their internet banking website. As you can see from the SSL Labs report, there's a bunch of issues here. They're vulnerable to several SSL vulnerabilities, including Zombie Poodle, Golden Doodle, and the Open SSL Zero Length vulnerabilities. Yes. Those are real vulnerability names. Crypto nerds have some very bizarre senses of humor. Um, Zombie Poodle is found in products from Cit Citrix, F5, and others. 1.1% of websites uh, globally are vulnerable. Golden Doodle can be found in Cisco, Citrix, and F5 products again. Uh, it only affects 0.2% of websites worldwide. Um, Golden Doodle is essentially the old Poodle vulnerability that we had about three years ago. But instead of only happening once every two or three hundred attempts, it happens every time. And you can, you can decrypt data between a, a client and a server. Um, finally, the OpenSSL zero length vulnerability, it impacts several uh, OpenSSL versions and F5 once again. Um, and it only impacts about 0.2% of websites overall. Even if these vulnerabilities are resolved, um, there's still a bunch of configuration issues that are, that are, that are in place. Um, there's issues that need to be fixed with PFS and AED ciphers. There's 64-bit ciphers still being used that need to be disabled. There's a lot of work this bank has to have done. What can we conclude from the results here, though? Um, I'm guessing they're an F5 customer. Um, they're behind on their patching. They're at least six months behind on their patching. 
These vulnerabilities were all publicly disclosed back in March this year. Um, there's been yeah, six, seven months patch windows since the patches were release, uh, released and they've failed to do any of the patching cycle so far. Now, they might say something that patching is hard or they had other priorities. Um, but if they're not patching their external load balances, what else are they behind in patching in their environment? Their Java frameworks, their mainframes, their web gateways, their phone gateways, their desktops. Um, it really does make you really worry and really think about what's going on in that organization. Two other banks have an unusual response to these assessments. They've put their heads in the sand. These banks have requested that their internet banking sites not be tested through the Qual Qualys OpenSSL server test tools. If you put them in, you get a polite message saying you can't test this address. Um, that didn't stop me using a different tool to perform the assessments. Um, and looking at those results, um, they would have only scored a B if they were lucky or maybe a C. They didn't fail, but they didn't score up with the rest of their peers. And that's definitely a reason why you would want to hide your results. Um, if they're trying to hide this from their customers, what else are they hiding? What other issues do they might have that they're trying to not tell us about? And that's a really sort of scary thing from an optics point of view. What else are they hiding? One area that the banks do really well is um, the selection of TLS protocols. Um, the results generally follow the patterns that SSL, SSL Pulse sees. Um, all sites tested um, have TLS 1.2. One site actually supports TLS 1.3, which is really awesome to see. The problem is that a lot of sites are still supporting TLS 1.1 and 1.0. 56% of banks support TLS 1.0. TLS 1.0 actually has its 20th birthday party next, uh, in, next year, in January. Um, it's a legacy protocol that shouldn't be used. It suffered some major vulnerabilities, some of which have been mitigated client-side in the browsers, but others just haven't been fixed. It's a very vulnerable implementation now. Um, Chrome, Edge, Firefox, and Safari are all going to stop supporting TLS 1.1 and 1.0 in January this year, in next year. So it's only got a few more months before those major browsers will even support it as a protocol. Most organizations, when you ask them of why they're still supporting TLS 1.0, will talk about backwards compatibility. We need our customers running on IE6 and Windows XP to be able to still access our websites. That's unsupported by the browser manufacturers. In January, Windows 7 becomes unsupported. Why are we still supporting Windows XP? Why are we keeping insecure protocols around for some customers that aren't going to patch, that are too lazy to upgrade? Why should we be vulnerable for 1% or 2% of the, the rest of the industry that's yet to upgrade? The PCI DSS standard actually requires that all sites accepting credit card payments remove support for TLS 1.0 by June 2018. That's June last year. Um, so from a compliance aspect, Australian banks don't really care about PCI DSS because they haven't killed off TLS 1.0. Kind of an interesting thing to, to see. To encourage people to get rid of TLS 1.1 and 1.0, SSL Labs have already announced that come January, they're going to cap the score of any website that still supports those protocols to a B. And that changes the scores on a lot of the bank's websites quite dramatically. As you can see, orange is where they're currently at, red is where they will go after January. The majority of sites will move from A plus and A all the way down to B because they support this legacy protocol. Maybe then the banks will get the, pro the motivation that they need to upgrade. My final observation is around the use of extended uh, validation certificates. EV certificates 
offer no benefits over domain verified certificates in terms of security or usability. Chrome and Firefox have removed EV indicators from their browsers. Basically, EV certificates are just plain bullshit, but we still see them in use, in heavy use in Australian banks. Australian banks will pay good money for security theatre. Um, almost three quarters of banks are still spending money on purchasing EV certificates each year, compared to 8.8% of sites globally as monitored by SSL Pulse. Maybe they could save some money there and spend some more money on patching. Um, all the younger banks, the neo banks, they're pretty much all using, um, uh, they're all using uh, standard domain verification certificates, and most of them are using Let's Encrypt. There's been a move across to those automated certificates by the younger banks. Um, the neo banks are really starting to move ahead in this part of part of the uh, SSL security space, you could say. So, what steps can you be taking? First, keep deploying TLS. Um, I focused on HTTP connections today, but you can actually use TLS for a bunch of other things. Anything that's over TCP, you can protect using TLS, and you should try to. And that includes email, um, uh, uh, you know, IC, uh, IC, uh, not ICQ, uh, um, IRC, you know, all of those basic protocols that are running over TCP, you can stick over, t over a TLS stream. Um, if you want to make sure that you're doing things correctly, SSL Labs provides a guide on how to do, do it all and configure it all for a lot of the major uh, web stacks and server stacks, which is really great to see. There's a link here to that um, GitHub page. Finally, use tooling to ensure that you're getting the results that you expect. Um, there's a plugin for Azure DevOps that as part of a build or release pipeline, you can actually scan a website and see what result, it, what score it will get back. So you could actually break your build if for some reason your score drops from A to B, and then go in and actually investigate what happens there. Really great tooling. It's all free as part of just a free plugin. Um, automation here is really going to help you. So the third criteria is the security TXT file. Sometimes people will find security issues, and believe it or not, they actually want to try and get them fixed. The problem is trying to find the right people to talk to. I'm sure that everybody here has seen a tweet like this um, from a security researcher that's reaching out trying to find somebody that can help. Um, as somebody that leads an organization's IT team um, and is responsible for our IT security, this is the stuff that appears in my nightmares. It's these sorts of things that would really scare me as, as an IT leader. Researchers spend a considerable amount of time and effort trying to find the right person to contact when they find a vulnerability. Their goal is to find someone who's going to respond, action, and understand the issues. They want someone who's going to work to fix the issues, not send in a, a team of lawyers or a SWAT team or just hound the researcher with legal uh, mumbo jumbo. Um, there are plenty of cases where people have been actively discouraged from reporting issues simply because of the history of that company responding to security vulnerability disclosures. So how do you even begin to find the right person? You could look through their website. You might try and find a contact form or contact details. Social media is sometimes effective, but it usually ends up in the social media or marketing teams. They don't really know how to handle these sorts of incidents. You could try calling up their call centers. I know some researchers, researchers have done that. That didn't end well. Um, you could stalk people on LinkedIn. Find people that know people that work at the organization that might be able to help. I've been there as well. Um, unfortunately, sometimes a tweet like this is the only mechanism you have available. You hope that it lands uh, in the Twitter feed of somebody that can actually help. And these techniques come uh, with a lot of problems, though. 
This, this is a last resort that has a lot of problems. Firstly, the researcher is now, in some cases, publicly announcing that there's some sort of vulnerability with this organization or some sort of security breach with this organization. And that will often result in attackers trying to get into the organization or if an attacker is already in that organization, covering up all their tracks and, and proceeding to leave that organization. Um, and that has happened on several occasions that I know of. Um, the other big thing is that it might create unwanted media attention. You've got a researcher like Brian Krebs, who's a very well-known person in the inf information security industry going, hey, I think I found something wrong with Yahoo. And that's going to get press. A big concern is how an organization is going to react to a vulnerability disclosure. Um, especially when it's done on a mechanism like tw Twitter, but really any medium. Um, just as people have a poor response to criticism, organizations can react terribly. Instead of acknowledging that the issue is there uh, and resolving them, they'll go full Hulk and just want to smash everything and destroy everything. They don't want to hear about the issues. They don't want to fix the issues. They just want to silence the, issue, the researcher, silence their critics. Toxic responses to breaches and vulnerability disclosures happens far too often still. It happens quite a lot. They are extremely difficult for people that just want to get things done. As a security researcher, we just want things to be better. As somebody that's provided feedback to organizations, it's discouraging and depressing when the responses are overwhelmingly negative, toxic, and destructive. This presentation in particular has been difficult. There was a toxic response from one of the institutions, and that does take a mental and emotional toll on our security researcher. Even preparing today to make sure that they're not going to have a similar response is a challenge. And this is the problem that Ed Fadouli has tried to tackle in his draft IEFT standard, known as security.txt, or by its full name, a method for web security policies. The idea is to have a place where you can list your security contacts where these reports can be sent to. Um, it's got to be in a predictable location. And for that, we use the .well-known folder um, that's defined in RFC 5785. We use it as a base directory um, for a bunch of different files, and in this case, the security.txt. It's also recommended that you redirect slash security.txt of your domain to that well-known slash security.txt file as well. In the file, you can specify information such as how you contact the organization. It could be email, it could be a web form, encryption keys to be used, how you acknowledge researchers, policies, hiring information, and even a preferred language for what that contact should be in. And this is what a security.txt file looks like. This is Facebook's. Um, they've got four entries in their file. They have a contact. Um, directive, and this one's mandatory, and that basically says go to this form to submit your uh, reports. Facebook acknowledges the efforts of security researchers who have helped them, and they include a link to a page where they make those acknowledgements. It's a way for them to say thank you. Next is a link to Facebook's policy on what security researchers should do when they're reporting issues or even when they're looking for security vulnerabilities. And finally, there's a link to the team's job openings. Great way to find people when you want to hire them, especially if it's a security researcher, if they find this, they might apply for a job, and then they might help your organization. So how did the banks go? Only one bank had a security.txt file, and that was AMP. I shouldn't be surprised with this one, but somehow I still was. Um, so what could we infer from these results? Um, is AMP the only bank that really encourages independent security researchers to report problems? No, but they're the only ones that make it easy to. Um, 
Try and use Google to find the security contact details for most of the other banks. It's almost impossible. Um, if you don't have a massive contact list of people, it's a challenge. That's why these files are here. It can really be inferred that AMP are the only bank that are trying to make this process easy for us. Um, it's such a simple thing to do. So what can you do on Monday when you go back home, you go back into the office? Firstly, work out who in your organization should be receiving security reports. Um, it might be your security team or your support team. Don't make it your media teams. Don't make it your lawyers. Don't make it your solicitors. Don't make it your exec team. Make it technical people that know how to respond to these reports. Once you've found out who should be receiving them, sit down with them and generate a security.txt file. At the site securitytxt.org, they actually have a tool that will help you generate that file for you and it will guide you through that process. Once you've got the file, generate a PR, push to prod. Um, if you're in a situation where you can't simply just put a file on your web server, but you've got, say, a web application firewall or a load balance in place, use a redirection rule. Um, I've done that now on a few sites where I've got Cloudflare configured, and I have a page rule that redirects that off to a, a another web host where the security TXT file is. So there's ways around this even if you don't fully control the site. Um, remember that the contact directive is mandatory. Um, you can have multiple contacts if you, if you so wish. It's also recommended that you have the encryption directive so people can actually encrypt the reports they send to you. Uh, it's also recommended that you sign the file digitally as well. If you don't have a PGP or a GPG, GPG key, and the whole idea of creating one sounds terrifying, use keybase.io. That's what I'm doing now. It's so simple to use keybase.io to you know, get a crypto key and then sign the file and have it all ready to go. So what other criteria could we have looked at? Um, we could have looked at their email security practices, SPF, DKIM, and DMARC. Um, they're still uh, underdeployed within the banking industry. And with the high level of phishing attacks, these tools would greatly help uh, protect their customers and just protect the internet on a hot hole. We could have looked at the use of CAA records uh, or DNSSEC. Um, CAA records are a way for an organization to say which certificate authorities are allowed to issue certificates on their behalf. So you can say, I only want Symantec, I only want Komodo or Sectigo to issue certificates, or I only want Let's Encrypt to issue certificates for my domain. And then anything that doesn't match that pattern, there's a, a report mechanism um, built into CIA. DNSSEC is a mechanism for basically building a hierarchy of signed and trusted DNS responses. It's another way of preventing some of the DNS hijacking attacks that we see going on. Um, we could look at the bank's use of MFA and password requirements. Um, that's a really fun criteria to look at if you've got the time, but you need to go ahead and create bank accounts with them and share your data with them, which if you find out they're not very good, that's always a problem. Um, another one is just to look at breaches that have happened. Um, here in Australia, we have breach reporting legislation. You have to report certain breaches. Some of the banks have had reportable breaches over the past couple of years, some entertaining ones. I really recommend you go and look at them. Um, the great thing about breach notification legislation is you'll often get a very detailed write-up on what led up to the incident and what happened to resolve it. And they can be really, really interesting in learning the security and just IT management processes of an organization. Those reports can be very, very great at learning what not to do. So I got asked a question a few times. Why does it matter? Why does it matter that they, have, they don't have all the security headers in place? So why does it matter that they've got insecure TLS protocols? Um, the banks have other product controls in place to ensure that people aren't going to run off and steal your money. 
at least they claim to, um, they have a lot of different controls in place. Troy Hunt talked about them in a blog post the other week about the different controls they have in place and that really a lot of this is optics. And yes, it is a, a, a talk about the optics of security in a way. Just as we would naturally have concerns over this chap, a vampire running the Australian blood bank, I've got a concern about the optics of Australian bank security. Um, sure, the vampire understands the, the scarcity of the resource that they're managing, blood, and I'm sure that they would ensure that no, none goes to waste. But you'd still not feel safe with a vampire running the blood bank. Um, and so I'm not comfortable with these optics of simple stuff just being left behind and not being thought of. Um, but Australian banks, by not implementing even the simplest levels of protection, they're not presenting themselves in a favourable light. Um, and even if they have that fancy AI to block that supposed illegitimate login, um, how can we have confidence in the fancy AI and machine learning algorithms if they're not doing the basics? So by now you're probably waiting to hear which bank Eve selected and which was the worst bank and which was the best bank. Instead, I'm going to disappoint you and say that I've shown you how to perform the assessments yourself. You've seen some of the evidence. You can go and collect your own and leave the, I'm going to leave the choice up to you to make. So here are some links you'll probably want to grab. Um, I'll also post these up on Twitter and stuff in the next few days. Um, so there's security headers. Um, there's the list to make other websites um, do the Harlem Shake if you'd like. Um, SSL Labs. There's the SSL Labs Best Practices Guide. Um, Hard and Eyes I didn't talk about today. Hard and Eyes is basically, it's similar to SSL Labs and security security headers, it performs a bunch of different assessments on a single website from DNS through to SPF and DMARC. It's not as detailed, but it's a really great general overview. Um, there's also links to hstspreload.org and securitytxt.org. Thank you all for coming and listening to me this afternoon. Uh, before I finish up, I just want to thank the organizers of NDC and all the volunteers. Uh, for all their hard work. Thank you very much.